Hi, I'm Randy Robinson. This is Live Today TV. I'm here with the pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, just outside Nashville. He is also the author of the book called The Gospel of Yes, Pastor Mike Glenn. Thank you for being Randy, here. Randy, thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you coming by. Now, I, before we get into the book, I got to ask you, I mean, you know, Brentwood is like, you know, the fancy part of Nashville. Oh, yeah. So, you you yeah. got a few, uh, anybody in your church I'd recognize? Yeah, probably. Probably if you came, you might see Brad and Kim Paisley and a couple of other. Now, now if you know the, any of the writers, we have a lot of the writers, lot of writers, which is the dangerous thing about pre preaching at Brentwood, because if you say anything clever, all your writers go, <laughs> so it's like, hey, 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 it's yeah. copyrighted now, guys. I want them. <laughs> this is true. You, you, should, you should have a disclaimer. Right? Right. All the That's right. All the material is copyrighted. Send, Word for a third. Send, yeah. I know how that goes. So. Send your royalties here. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, I guess the music in your church is phenomenal. It is. I, I envy you guys. Yeah, and we have great music here in Dallas for there. And you, you know you're in a different kind of church when uh, the minister of worship will ask you, how do you want that music to feel? <laughs> because that depends on who he asks to sing it. Because uh -huh. if you want it to feel this way, we ask this person to sing it. And, but everybody in town sings, plays, and writes, and, yeah. and they're all good. It's, yeah. it's an amazing place to live. Yeah, I hear rumors that you've uh, been known to hang out in bars as a Baptist well, preacher. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the few Baptist preachers who get to hang out in bars. And because if, if you know the guitar players and the singers and that kind of stuff, then they'll call you and say, hey, we're, we're playing down here or singing over here and kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So, But they do let me kind of slip in the back. So hang in the back ministry. with them. So, yes, ministry, yes, right. Ministry. Mission project. So. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. All right, let's talk about the gospel of mm -hmm. yes. Um, it's an interesting title. Uh, what, what does that mean? I, I grew up like a lot of people uh, going to church every time the doors were open, and I was uh, I was in one of those churches where I was held over hell like a marshmallow every Sunday, <laughs> and we were told, you know, these, these are all the things you're not supposed to do. You're against this. We're against that, and. And so we would leave there knowing what we were against, and next Sunday we'd get together and we'd praise God we hadn't done anything. So, you know, the whole thing was to stay away from sin, not to follow Christ. Uh, it's scriptural, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. the stay away from sin part is scriptural. Stay, stay away from sin. Now, uh, and, and, and some people who read the book said, you know, you don't take sin seriously enough. That's not true. I just don't think you, you defeat sin or engage sin by thinking about sin. Mm. I think you overcome sin by thinking more about Christ. Mm. Okay, F uh, Paul in Philippians says, here are the things you think about. Whatever is beautiful, noble, righteous, whatever is moral excellence, these are the things that you want in your mind. Mm -hmm. But we spend so much time thinking about, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And, and then that becomes what's in your mind. For instance, I, I have a real bad addiction to Oreo cookies. Uh, I, you know, I cannot eat just one. You, you can confess something I worse just, than I that. I just know that it's, just it's Oreos, <laughs> Oreos are bad for okay, me. Okay. So I eat. So, but if I get up in the morning and say, okay, today I'm not going to need an Oreo cookie. Today I'm, I'm not going to twist it and dip it in the milk and eat the cream. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. Today I'm going to be strong. Well, if that's all you're thinking about, by the end of the day, you're in the cookie aisle. Yeah. And you're throwing every bag of Oreos they got in there. Yeah. Rather than... Starting your day with worship, this is Christ. This is who Christ is. This is who Christ revealed himself to me. This is who he's calling me to be. And then focusing out of that positive. And when you live out of that yes, this is the yes of who I am in Christ. This is the yes of what he's called me to do. Uh, and, and if you know your yes, then the no's will kind of take care of themselves. Yeah, I'd never thought about it, but years ago I invented for myself what I call the substitution diet. I uh, knocked off 50 pounds, right. and it's exactly that thing. Exactly I didn't right. get up thinking about what I wasn't going to have. Mm -hmm. I actually got up thinking about what I was going to have. I'm going to have exactly this right. kind of salad mm -hmm. for lunch, and I'm going to have this kind of fruit, you know. And, and so by, by pouring in the good stuff, the good stuff, it, I was it, really pushed, it really pushed out the bad it stuff. It pushed out the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, that, that actually... That resonates with me. Give me some of the highlights, some of the other points in the book. That uh, once, once you begin to understand who you are in Christ is determined by, one, you are the bearer of the Imago Dei. We have, uh, we have the self-esteem thing in, in our culture that you have to give a kid a trophy for everything, and, and it really messes the kid up because they know they're lousy, <laughs> and you're telling them, you're wonderful. Well, I went over two, Mom. I, you know, I know that I didn't do well. Um, the, this, so self-esteem doesn't come from somebody telling you you're good. It comes from two things in Scripture. One, it comes from we are the bearer of the image of God, uh, which is like finding a painting uh, that nobody knew about and discovering that it is signed by a famous artist. Mm -hmm. It is not the painting that is valuable. It is the signature of the artist. And in the same way, 
uh, we are valuable because we're signed by the greatest artist of all. And interestingly enough, God introduces himself in scripture as an artist. The mm. first book is about, look at, look at what I've made. Come see what I've made. The book of salvation in the Old Testament is Exodus, which is the second book. Um, and, the, and the thing that an artist loves to do is show you what he's made, who he is. And you and I, uh, human beings, are the, are, the, are, are the crowning moment of creation. My friends in real estate tell me that something is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And on the day that the price for our lives was demanded, Christ gave his life for us. Mm. So that's our value. And I, I can't tell you the value that that gives a person, regardless, from child uh, on, on into senior adulthood. You're valuable simply because you're somebody that Christ died for and because you're somebody who bears his image. Now, if we understand that that value is secure, you can't take it away from me, mm. nor can you add anything to it. Mm. That comes solely from Christ. Then I'm free to let you be who you are. I don't have to manipulate my friends. Husbands don't have to manip manipulate their wives or wives manipulate their husbands trying to get them to give them something uh, that they need. I'm free to let you be who you are and let my wife be who she is and live in the freedom and the joy that that brings. It, can't that be dangerous at times? Because I know I'm not always who I should be. I'm not always perfect. Right? No. No, you're and, not. And so when you, when you say let someone be who they are, a lot mm -hmm. of times that's a euphemism for excusing sin. Well, yeah, for, and, and for, and for the, and the, the worldly teaching is tolerance. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to let you breathe, but I have, as opposed to biblical hospitality. And, and the difference there is, is agape love always, God love always seeks the best for the beloved. And if I'm authentically your Christian brother, then I'm going to hold you accountable, not to all the things you do wrong, but to your best self. Mm. See, the times when, when my boys were growing up, the, the best discipline we did for them was when we sit down at the table with them and say, we have literally known you before you were born. Mm -hmm. We have the sonogram pictures. We, we can pick you out. We have twins. Uh, we, we know exactly who you were before you were born. This is who you have shown us you are. Now, this behavior doesn't match the child we know. Mm. So, sin is when you miss the mark. Mm -hmm. uh, what was going on in your life that, that you didn't trust Christ to, to, to get you through it or that you didn't trust who you created you to be? Uh, that is a lot more, uh, I, I think, effective than me showing up going, hey, Randy, you messed up. One, you already know that. Right. You're already feeling bad. Right. And, and if you're high D like me, then you've already beat yourself up about it enough. Right. Right. And the last thing you need is somebody coming and reminding you of your failure. Yeah. But, but somebody comes by and says, hey, this is who we know you to be. This is where we know you're going. What happened? Mm -hmm. See, then, then there's some teaching and some, and, and some growth out of that rather than just the condemnation. So when we do, some, we do see someone who is... is living in sin or missing the mark in some way, it's not a matter of, of putting them down, but lifting them up. That's right. That's right. Holding, holding them up against the, against the vision of, of who they're called to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're doing now won't help that vision happen. Mm -hmm. And this is what we ultimately want. And, and, and the reason uh, that, that God is against sin is not he was you know, walking around going, what do people like doing? And somebody told him, he said, well, let's make that against the rules. <laughs> right. uh, sin hurts his children. Yeah. And, and the reason we, we move to uh, redeem somebody in sin or to recover or to reach out to somebody who's struggling is that it is hurting them. Mm -hmm. And if you love them, you cannot stand by and watch them self-destruct. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, what we want to do is to, in too many churches, is we want to run by and say, Randy, you messed up, you're going to burn in hell. Yeah. And then we go off and, uh, and, and say that we, 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 we told him, you yeah. know, he had to straighten up now. <laughs> yeah. Rather than the good Samaritan who will, who will bind up your wounds and, and take care of you. Right. Come back and check That's on right. you later. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. This is interesting, okay, because I've talked to several Baptist pastors recently. And I've noticed... Are you still in therapy for it? <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll work you, huh? <laughs> yeah, my, my pastor may be since he left the Baptist church officially, but yet we're still tied anyway. It's a long story. Um, and I've noticed something. I've noticed an outpouring of grace in the Baptist church. 
Um, not to the point, you know, where sin abounds, you know, right. as Paul said, may never, never be. But it seems like that, that a lot of pastors have moved away from the, the condemnation and the guilt and, and into what you're talking about, which is really reaching mm -hmm. out and, and trying to help people without, you know, leaving the truth in any way, but kind of making this paradigm shift uh, to, to be more, more encouraging and more, more uplifting. Have you mm -hmm. seen, have you noticed any of that in, in your... Well, yeah, and, there, and it's, it's uh, a lot of the preaching has gone a, a lot more uh, to practical application. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of, and I think there, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, you, we have a number of people who are literally showing up with no Christian background. Yeah. It is not unusual now. We have a young adult service called Kairos on Tuesday night. And it's not unusual for them not to have a Bible. Mm -hmm. We put Bibles out everywhere and say, if you don't have one, take it. If it makes you feel better, stick it up under your shirt and tell somebody you stole it. We, <laughs> we don't care. Just get it. Um, it's not unusual for them not to know the stories. Uh, I, I taught the story of Joseph. They love Joseph. Uh, you know, his brothers sold him. They wanted to know, can you still sell brothers? And you know, that was a big deal, you know, dysfunctional family. But when we got to where he was in prison, one of the guys raised his hand in the middle of the teaching. He said, when does he meet Mary? Different Joseph. I said, pardon me? Yeah, when does he move to Bethlehem and have, meet Mary and a Jesus be born thing? And I said, mm -hmm, different Joseph. And so he hits the guy next to him and goes, dude, there's two of them. So, but he had no concept. That's funny. So, so to... to uh, you know, when, when I started more years than I wanted to know, or wanted to tell you, you would literally begin evangelism by saying, the Bible says, the old Billy Graham line, mm -hmm. the Bible says, and you would understand, okay, that's the Bible, that's the Word of God. We may disagree on interpretation, but we would not doubt its authority. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to begin way before that. Mm -hmm. You know, Find out um, uh, the, the person's journey, their worldview, yeah. what assumptions are they bringing yeah. into the process, yeah. and then literally starting from where they are to help them see the authority of Scripture and then go from there. Yeah, let me ask you about Cairo since you brought it up, because mm -hmm. that did start in your church, mm -hmm. did it not? Mm -hmm. By a couple of people that came to you and Yeah, to you know, I've been in the church 21 years, so I've been, in, I've been there long enough to watch some of my children literally grow up to yeah. be young adults now, and they're, you know, they're all very successful, they're really sharp. So one of them called me and said, will you go to lunch with us? I said, yeah. And so they had their PowerPoint presentation, their demographic studies, and said, we want to do a young adult worship service for, uh, for Nashville. And I said, that's great. It's a good idea. I'll help you get it started. But I'm the pastor of a mega church. I don't have time to do this. Sure. And, um, and so we started on Tuesday night. You know why we selected Tuesday night? No idea. You want to think that the Spirit said Tuesday night. One of the guys looked at us and said, let's do it Tuesday. Television stinks. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. So that's how we ended up on Tuesday night. But um, uh, they started telling their friends, we're now run anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200. Well, and, uh, and it's it's all a, a bunch of other churches. Uh, it's, it's ball, ball, uh, other churches have come in. What are you doing? That kind of stuff. And I've been doing it now for almost 10 years. Hmm. If you ever go there and sit down with them, and hear their story, they'll break your heart. How and so? all of us, all of us come. Uh, one night we were doing a. Um, we found out they don't get along with their fathers. A lot of father issues. So praying our Father who is in heaven wrecks them. Uh, so you have to really talk through that a lot. Uh, so we did this thing where we said, okay, you're going to write your dad. You have to honor your parents. You're going to write your dad a Father's Day card. I don't care if the card says, I don't want to hate you anymore. If that's all you got, that's all you got. And I said, if you get stuck, I'll be sitting over here. Come, come talk to me. <laughs> and they would line up, Randy, and read the letters. It was, it was just one run after the other. <laughs> and the, there was one a young lady who kept letting everybody go first. Yeah. I said, okay, this is going to be good. And she sat down, she handed me a blank piece of paper and said, my father started sexually abusing me <laughs> when I was six years old. And you tell me what I write. <laughs> and after that service was over, uh, I remember walking across the parking lot telling myself, just get to the car. Get to the car. You can fall apart in the car. And I put my head down on the steering wheel and I said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do. But if you'll tell me how to reach these young adults, I'll do anything you tell me to do. And, uh, and that has been a turning point for me personally. Uh -huh. And uh, actually more fun than anything I do is preaching on Tuesday night. Mm. My, my leader said, you're spreading yourself too thin. You need to do something else. I said, okay, I'll give up Sunday morning. 
something. They said, why would you do that? And I said, well, you think about it. I mean, you guys walk in late yawning, <laughs> looking at your watch. You know, these guys, they'll, they'll text me during the preaching. They'll stay, you know, hour, hour and a half afterwards. Mm -hmm. They'll email me during the week going, hey, here's what I'm doing. Where would you rather preach? Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so there's an opening. Yeah, church, that's, right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> just add more music. But, but it is the rawest preaching I did. Mm. Oh, that's I great. Mean, it is just, you know, they, they, we, we did all the things the experts told us to do, and it rolled around like a lead balloon. Finally, I sat down with them and said, what do you want? Mm. And they said, read it. Tell me what it means. Tell me how I do it. Mm. And I said, that's not real creative. <laughs> and they said, we've never heard it. Straightforward, yeah. We, we've yeah. never heard it. And... Yeah. So good, it, good, so, good advice yeah. for any pastor, yeah. right? Especially yeah. guys starting out. Don't, don't assume that they know when you say, now you know the story of Jonah. Yeah. They don't. They don't. So you have to literally turn, turn to the Bible and give them the context and then to give them the application. Mm. Good. Good stuff. Great. Thanks for stopping by. Be oh, sure my. to check out The Gospel of Yes. It's available Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookstores everywhere. And, Mike and Glenn online. Mike Glenn online. Mm -hmm. Is that your website? Mm -hmm. All right. And, and what about the church if people want to catch up uh, on a message? Brentwoodbaptist.com. It's, all, it's all on there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Be sure to check that out. Thanks again for being with us. All right. Thank you. Enjoy it.